Okay, so it's 4 p.m. Um, I have a warm-up question up there. Um, how many people think that they know the answer to this? This is not meant to be some hard thing where you have to solve three or four Diophantine equations. This is just this is just a really simple answer to this. So we've got some people that have the answer. Anyone that needs more time? Anyone needs more time? No one puts up their hand, but then they're still writing. You guys need more time? No? Okay. Okay, so the only people answering are saying no, so I'll move on. Okay, uh, remember last class, Wednesday, I taught you the concept of a congruence class. It's some symbol in square brackets. That's a set of integers that are all congruent to the same thing, modulo the modulus. So we want to take a bunch of congruence classes and combine them using set notation and express all integers. The answer is just in this case where m equals 3, you have the congruence class 0, union the congruence class 1, union the congruence class 2. Any integer can be written as uh, any integer will be in one of those three sets, right? So all integers is equal to the union of these three. Express the empty set. Well, none of these uh, sets um, overlap. If you're congruent to 2 mod 3, then you're not congruent to 1 mod 3. Okay, so the intersection is the empty set. Okay, you see what I mean? That was an easy one. Now, a reminder. I defined addition for congruence classes. I defined multiplication for congruence classes. But I didn't define division for congruence classes. And don't, well, I'm recommending not to write something like A over B in square brackets or square brackets A over square brackets B. We don't want to divide congruence classes or the things inside the congruence classes and write it down. It's dangerous, let's not do that, okay? Throughout this course, we prefer writing things on one line. Like, so if I'm saying uh, X is divisible to uh, Y, like, uh, X, X divides Y, rather than writing that as X over Y or something, it's better to write Y equals K times X. Right? Uh, because remember uh, when we had 0, 0 divides 0 because 0 equals k times 0. If you write it as 0 over 0, that's going to start to look weird to your calculus professor, right? So let's, um, let's just keep in mind to avoid using the divide symbol. There's probably one or two theorems that do have a, two integers divided by each other. One of them is uh, GCD divides something. So that theorem, you have like uh, GCD of A over D comma B over D equals one. So that one involves division of integers. But apart from that, almost everything, we're not going to be doing dividing at all. OK, let's get on to lecture 26. Ah, OK, Mobius quiz tonight. Don't forget, it is a Friday, but we still have a Mobius quiz. Uh, assignment 8, which covers up to page 133, and the solutions to assignment 7, they've been posted online, I believe. So it's, uh, it's a good time to look at your solutions to assignment 7. This course is building on itself, so all the extended Euclidean algorithm stuff, you have to know that stuff inside out to do the Diophantine stuff, which you have to know inside out to do all this Chinese remainder theorem and uh, Fermat's little theorem stuff. So now, um, I'm going to recommend for this weekend to finish reading up to the end of chapter 8. Okay, and I've covered most of the stuff in the classes now. I've been doing course, exercise, course notes exercises in the classes, identical to the course notes. So most of it's been covered. Just fill in the gaps, because on Monday I want to start doing some practice questions. You really need them for the final. Mobius quizzes seem to have covered things out of order. That's another reason why I would say to read up to the end of chapter 8, because you might have seen, like, the schedule says that the Mobius quizzes are only going to go up to chapter 7 or something, and then there's some congruence relation thing on a Mobius quiz that's supposed to be for the previous week, right? You know what I'm talking about? That happened a few times to you? Yeah, okay. I'm not in charge of the Mobius quizzes at all, but this is advice. Just read up to the end of chapter 8. Even if that doesn't happen, even if everything is according to schedule, if you know Fermat's Little Theorem and Chinese Remainder Theorem and Splitting Modulus Theorem, that can help you. Because if you have to do x to the 122 mod 7 or something, then 
you know, you could do it the, the brute force way where it's still five or six lines. We did it in class. But once you know this Fermat's little theorem and stuff, you're going to be able to do that even faster, maybe. Okay? And then we have assignment eight, which is also going to go up to 133. So you got to do the readings anyway. But I would suggest to finish up to the end of chapter eight. Now, objectives for today's class. Now, sorry about this L. The font, this happened in the downstairs class too. In my office computer, which is also on the Nexus network, um, I thought that all these computers were the same, but the font on my, uh, <laughs> on my office computer, uh, just this computer doesn't seem to like it. So FLT, that's Fermat's Little Theorem. And the Chinese Remainder Theorem. So that's what we're going to do today. Now, I don't write a capital L. So this was supposed to be a cursive L, which the computer just didn't understand. But I don't write F capital LT because that means Fermat's last theorem. You all remember Fermat's last theorem? Or you remember about it? Yeah? So the prop proposition was first stated by Pierre de Fermat in a margin of a copy of Ar Arithmetica. Fermat added that he had a proof for Fermat's last theorem that was too large to fit in the margin. So he has this huge book called Arithmetica with lots and lots of pages. And he says, I couldn't fit the proof in the margin, so I'm not going to give you the proof. And then it took 360 years for someone else to prove it, and that proof was hundreds of pages long. Okay, so that's Fermat's last theorem. Don't write F capital LT. You're going to see in the course notes and everything, it's like F lowercase LT. But lowercase L looks like an I, so they do a cursive L. So Fermat's little theorem. Okay, so Fermat's last theorem was 1637. Fermat's little theorem was 1640, three years later. Oh, this must be harder, isn't it? Okay, he wrote this to his friend, Frenicle de Bessy. And as usual, Fermat did not prove his assertion. And this proposition, this is a quote now, and this proposition is generally true for all progressions in all prime numbers. The proof of which I would send to you if I were not afraid it would be too long. <laughs> so he's like, I'm not going to give you the proof because it's going to be too long. I would send it to you if it wasn't so long, but uh, yeah, Philip? Uh, oh, oh I thought your hand was up. You're scratching your head. Maybe something that Fermat's little theorem comes after Fermat's last theorem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're different theorems, you're going to see. Okay, so Euler gave a proof in 1736, much later. hundred. It took 90, 96 years to, to prove this. But uh, actually, Leibniz gave the same proof earlier than Euler. He just didn't publish it. It's an unpublished manuscript that was found by some historian later. That was before 1683. It was like at least, uh, at least as far back as 1683. So I didn't take, it took me 43 years to, to prove this thing. Okay, now, Frenicle de Bessy. Does anyone know this guy? Okay, I didn't know him either until I started studying Fermat's Little Theorem. But you might remember, I gave you this list of Diophantine equations from Wikipedia. The simplest one is this linear Diophantine equation, which we've, we already know everything about it now, right? Then we have uh, this, the Ramanujan-Hardy uh, equation. Well, this is, a, tax, this is uh, a Diophantine equation for which the solutions are related to taxicab numbers. And then you have Fermat's last theorem here. So these are the three first um, examples of Diophantine equations on Wikipedia. So Fermat's last theorem is here. And it turns out that Frenicle de Bessy, he's actually, the one thing he is famous for is that he was the first person to actually arrive at this taxicab number 1729. So Ramanujan was sick in the hospital, and his uh, supervisor at Cambridge University, he, uh, he was on his way to visit uh, Ramanujan at the hospital. He was taking an Uber, I mean a taxi cab. And in the taxi cab, the, the number, each taxi cab is numerically, like they have a license plate. <coughs> that license plate number was 1729. And Hardy was thinking while he was in the taxi, he's like, 1729? Wow, every single number, I know something about it. Like it's prime or it's divisible by 3 minus 1 or it's, you know, or it's <laughs> divisible by this or divisible by that. 1729, I don't know anything about 1729. That's interesting. It's the first number I've ever come across where I can't tell you anything about it. And then so... He actually told Ramanujan, the first thing he does when he gets to the hospital, he's like, by the way, I was in a taxi cab where the license plate number was 1729. Isn't that weird? There's nothing special about that number, is there? And Ramanujan says, no, there is something special about that number. It's the smallest number that can be written as a sum of cubes in two different ways. 
You can write it as 12 cubed plus 1 cubed or 9 cubed plus 10 cubed. There's two ways you can write it as a sum of cubes. And so now it's called a taxi cab number. That's the taxi cab number. In 1917, this happened at the hospital. But Frenicle de Basie, actually, back in the 1600s, was the first person to realize that 1729 was the smallest taxi cab number for, uh, uh, yeah, the smallest taxi cab number. So, yeah, he was famous for this Diophantine equation. And Fermat was famous for this Diophantine equation. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Okay, Fermat's little theorem. It's an easy one. For all primes p, if p doesn't divide a, then a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. So now, if I ask you what day of the week will it be 2 to the million days from now, you don't have to do that step-by-step -step decompose the exponent into all this stuff. You just know. If p doesn't divide a, then this huge exponent, well, okay, that's not a huge exponent, but 7 minus 1 is 6, then you can pull out uh, a, a, um, an a to the 6 immediately, right? So you can divide that huge exponent by 6, and then you can keep dividing it by 6, and then it's just, it's much more straightforward than what we did last week. You got it? Okay, so <clears throat> a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. Does anyone have any questions about this? That's Fermat's little theorem. Okay, the first, the first English use of Fermat's Little Theorem, of the phrase Fermat's Little Theorem that I could find, they actually said Little Fermat Theorem instead of Fermat's Little Theorem. But now we just call it Fermat's Little Theorem. It used to be called just the Little Fermat Theorem. It's not that big of a theorem. Okay, now be careful. P must be prime. What's 2 to the 4 minus 1 congruent to mod 4? Zero, because 2 to the 4 minus 1 is 2 to the 3. That's 8. 8 is divisible by 4. So 8 is congruent to 0 mod 4. So if p is not, that's precisely because 4 is not prime. The reason why that worked out that way is because 4 is not prime. If 4 was prime, then, uh, then you would have got, if you had the same thing on the left but 4 was prime, you would have got 1. But because 4 is not prime, it just happened that this is congruent to 0 instead of 1. Okay? Another one. Be careful. P must not divide A. Okay? What's 49 to the 7 minus 1 congruent to mod 7? 0. Because 49 is congruent to 0 mod 7. 49 is divisible by 7. So 49 is divisible, uh, 49 is congruent to 0 mod 7. So 49 to any exponent, that's just 0 to the exponent, right? So P must not divide A. That's really important. This theorem doesn't work if P is not prime and if it divides A. Okay, now I purposely put these two examples there. Be careful, be careful, because I know that people make mistakes where they start applying Fermat's little theorem. Second you see on, a, on an exam, they, they ask, prove that A to the P minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod P. People start applying Fermat's little theorem right away without checking the conditions first. Okay, and in fact, in the last class already, when I gave some of the examples later in the lecture, there's already people applying Fermat's little theorem when they, when they shouldn't be. Okay, so this is actually, there's a good reason why I'm explaining this part. So remember these conditions, commit this theorem to memory. You're going to be using it, left, right, and center. Corollaries to the Fermat little theorem. Okay, if P is a prime number, a to the p is congruent to a mod p. We don't even need this condition anymore. Why do we not need that condition? Eric. Um, no, because here we had that condition even when p was prime. Now, I'm not asking you anything that you can't answer. In the last class I asked the same question, we did get an answer. So, why does it not matter anymore whether or not p divides a? Philip. That might be related, but there's a more precise way of communicating the reason why P doesn't, we don't need to worry about whether or not P divides A. Grayson. Uh, well, if P did divide A, then it would just be zero congruent. Very good. So, first of all, this is the proof of the corollary. If P doesn't divide A, 
then just multiply both sides by a. Both sides of Fermat's little theorem. If p doesn't divide a, then you can use Fermat's little theorem. Fermat's little theorem applies. And then you just multiply both sides by a. Okay? And if p does divide a, then a is congruent to 0 mod p, right? Because p divides a. And if a is congruent to 0, then a to the p is congruent to 0. a times a times a times a, p times. That's divisible by p if a is divisible by p. So that's why we don't have to care. So this corollary is actually very powerful. So you can't always use Fermat's little theorem, but you can pretty much always use the corollary when p is prime, no matter what the integer a is. You got it? Got it? OK, should we move on? OK, here's another corollary. If p is prime and the congruence class a is not the 0 class, in the integers mod p, this, um, this set that I introduced on Wednesday, then the inverse of a is the congruence class a to the p minus 2. Do you see why that is? What do I mean by inverse? So multiplicative inverse. So first of all, when you see a to the minus 1, that's not the additive inverse. That's the multiplicative inverse. I, I introduced that on Wednesday. So this is the multiplicative inverse. What does the multiplicative inverse even mean? Uh, Grayson, you're going to answer the whole question, or just what does the multiplicative inverse mean? OK, so let me get Paige first, because you put up your hand, right? So what does the multiplicative inverse mean? That if you multiply it by, um, yeah, it's there exists like a b, like a sub or whatever. Yeah, a congruence class b. Class b such that a times b equals the congruence. Congruence class one. Very good. Yeah. So if I have congruence class a times congruence class b equals congruence class one, the congruence class b is the inverse of congruence class a, the multiplicative inverse, right? Okay. Now, Grayson, you want to say the whole thing? So why is the multiplicative inverse of a equal to a to the p minus 2? So we could multiply, multiply both sides by the congruence class a. Yeah. And then because a times the multiplicative inverse is the congruence class 1. Yeah. And on the other side, we can use the multiplication rules for congruence class. Yeah. 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 So let's, yeah. This isn't a solid proof or anything. The proof is in the course notes. I'm not going to spend 10 minutes explaining every single proof. But uh, the, the idea is that if you multiply this, if you multiply, if you have A and you multiply it by A inverse, then you will get, uh, you will get 1. Okay? So it's basically a corollary to the Fermat's little theorem. Okay? So if I have a and I multiply it by a to the p minus 2, the congruence class a to the p minus 2, I will get 1. Okay? Um, yeah, well, a times a to the p minus 2 is a to the p minus 1. Right? A, a times a to the p minus 2 is a to the p minus 1. The exponent just it goes from minus 2 to minus 1. And then a to the p minus 1 happens to be congruent to 1 mod p. So this congruence class, everything that is congruent to a to the p minus 1 is also going to be congruent to everything that is congruent to 1. OK, so um, I said to read those four pages from the course notes, um, the four pages on congruence classes. You didn't need to know all this modular arithmetic stuff, you, uh, well, all the congruence class stuff we did before. Just the four pages on congruence classes. Um, if you had read those four pages, I think it would be very useful because this notation is new. Yeah? It's not exactly the same, but they're related. Because basically anything, anything that is congruent to 1 mod p is in the congruence class, um, congruence class 1. So, so if p equals 3, 4 is in this. So this equals the set um, 1 is congruent to 3. Uh, 1 is congruent to 1 mod 3. 4 is congruent to 1 mod 3. 7 is congruent to 1 mod 3. Uh, 10 is congruent to 1 mod 3. And I also have negative numbers. There's, 
an infinite number of uh, integers that are all congruent to one mod um, one mod three. So basically, if something is congruent to one mod p, then it's also congruent to all of these other things mod p, because you can just subtract three a bunch of times from both left and right side, and you will get that that thing is congruent to one mod p. So it's saying different things. That's notation with the square brackets. It means something else. It's not a number. It's a set. But it happens that if something is congruent to one mod p, then it's, uh, it belongs to that set, one in square brackets. Does that make more sense for everyone? OK, good. Now, this one I skipped. I had a, a problem here that I was going to do with you, a practice problem using those corollaries. But I skipped it now that I've seen the final exam and assignment 8. I've seen the final exam, I've seen assignment 8, and I felt that showing this example is not going to help you on either of those. And I could show it to you if you really are interested. These notes, I've been putting up the notes on GitHub within 24 hours of the lecture for the last few lectures. So you'll see this tonight, hopefully. And if you really want to see this example, you can turn the font from white to black. The example's still there because I spent all the time typing it up, so I kept it there. But uh, you can convert it, the font from white to black, and you can see that example. But you're not going to need it for the final or assignment eight, as far as I can see. The final might change, though. It just came out last night to the instructors, and we're going to be giving advice on what to change. So there might be new questions added or removed. But for now, I'm just saying I don't need to do that example. So let's do a different practice problem. Determine all solutions to, this should say 30 mod 3. Determine all solutions to this huge nonlinear congruence relation. x to the 61 plus 26x to the 41 plus 11x to the 25 plus 20 is congruent to 30 mod 3. OK, in the last class, I gave two minutes. So I'll set my timer here. How many people are using Fermat's little theorem? How many people are using the corollary? Okay. How many people need more time? OK, how much time do you need, Yushan? One more minute? OK. Does anyone want more, one more minute, or you want me to go on with the answer? Because some people might be completely lost. They're not even making any progress, meaning that. So who wants me to go one more minute? Who wants me to do the answer? 
Two people want the answer. Two people want the... Okay, I'll do one more minute. Because it looks like Yusheng's almost done. Marissa, Alina, you want the answer because you didn't get it or because you already have it? Okay. Are you using Fermat's little theorem or the corollary? Okay. You good, Yusheng? Or you need more time? I got stuck. You got stuck. Okay. Where did you get stuck? Uh, I'm not even sure if this is correct. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's all right. Um, how do we solve nonlinear congruence relations? We did this last class, right? If it's a nonlinear congruence relation, how do we solve it? Grayson? You just make a table, right? So you make a table, that's what we did last time, right? We had x squared plus x is congruent to 2 mod 8 or something. And then we just said x equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, everything up to 1 minus, uh, everything up to 8 minus 1. And then we did x squared for each of those. And we calculated what those were congruent to mod 8. And then we did x squared plus 2x, or x squared plus x, or whatever it was. And then we got that those things were congruent to certain things mod 8. And then we found which columns of the table gave us something that was congruent to 2 mod 8. So here we could do that with a table with uh, 0, 1, and 2. But how, how are you going to calculate 2 to the 61? OK, bet. Uh, I gave you Fermat's little theorem and the corollary. So can we use Fermat's little theorem? Some people put up their hand when I said, Who, who's using Fermat's little theorem? Can we use it? Why can we use it? Why can't we use it? This is a test of whether or not you understand Fermat's little theorem. What are the conditions for Fermat's little theorem? Page. That like, the modulus has to be prime. Which is good. For like, s to the power of 61, six, or 3 doesn't divide to 61. And so you started using Fermat's little theorem? OK, sorry. That's, uh, you need 3 doesn't divide the base. P doesn't divide A. When you have A to the P minus 1, you need the modulus doesn't divide the base A. P doesn't divide A. So 3 doesn't divide X. So Well, three. we don't know whether or not 3 divides X. So we can't really apply Fermat's little theorem right away. But remember, there's a corollary to Fermat's little theorem that works for all bases A. No matter what the base A, it works. A to the P is congruent to A mod P for any prime P, no matter what the base, right? So why don't we, we use the corollary to Fermat's little theorem? So what's the corollary to Fermat's little theorem going to state, the first corollary? Yeah, Philip? Um, a, to a, to a to the P is congruent to A mod P. Okay, as long as P is prime. Here P is prime. So how are you going to write that in this, what's the useful relation here? Grayson. I think that x cubed is congruent to x. x cubed is congruent to x mod 3. OK, a to the p is congruent to a mod 3. OK, now you see what to do. We start with this equation. x to the 61 is x cubed to the 20 plus 1. 3 times 20 plus 1, that's 60, uh, 61. x cubed to the 13 plus 2, that's 41. <coughs> x cubed to the 8 plus 1, that's 25. OK? Now, x cubed is congruent to what? x. x cubed is congruent to x. OK? I'm, I'm just, here I'm just using the laws of exponents. I have something to the exponent, something plus 1. It's just, that's just, uh, the plus 1 is like multiplying by x. So that's what I've done here. Now, x to the 20. Now, people are going to be, in the last class, everyone's trying to write this down. This is going to go online. Writing this down is not going to help you. 
it will not help you. You have to be able to follow what I'm saying here. So x to the 20, x cubed is congruent to x, right? x cubed is congruent to x. So x cubed to the, uh, uh, x cubed to the 20 is just going to be x to the 20, right? So x to the 20 times x. x cubed is congruent to x, so x cubed to the 13 is x to the 13, congruent to x to the 13. That's what I'm doing there. Now, x to the 20 times x, that's x to the 21. x to the 13 times x squared, that's x to the 15. Okay, what can I do next? Same thing again, right? This is, a, this is divisible by 3. So I have that that's x cubed to the 7. And what's x cubed congruent to? x. So x cubed to the 7 is congruent to what? x to the 7. Good. So x to the 7. x cubed to the 5. X cubed is congruent to X. So X cubed to the 5 is congruent to X to the 5. Okay, next. No, no, no. What, what's wrong here? Well, so X cubed is congruent to what? X cubed is congruent to X. So if you have something divisible by 3, uh, where, where, the, where you divide it by 3 and you still get 3, then that's just X cubed cubed, so that's x cubed is congruent to x, then you have x cubed, which is x, congruent to x. Okay, now x to the 7, that's x to the 6 times x to the 1. x to the 6 is x cubed to the 2, so that's x to the 2. Now x to the 2 times x, it's x cubed, right? So this is just x cubed is congruent to x. x to the 5, that's x to the 3 times x to the 2, x to the 3 is x x times x to the 2 is x cubed, x cubed is x, right? So I ended up with a linear Diophantine equation here. We just solved, uh, this isn't quadratic or cubic, this is 61th degree, 61st degree, nonlinear Diophantine equation. We turned it into a linear Diophantine equation. Okay, so we just end up with 38x plus 20 is congruent to 30 mod 3 then you can solve that Diophantine equation. You can convert it to a Diophantine equation and solve it easily. Okay? So now you're happy that you took math for your degree, right? In high school, you're learning some, some basic things. Now, you're learning some powerful techniques. We just did a 61st degree nonlinear equation where a congruence relation where we're only looking for integer solutions, and we did it in a few steps. Okay? All right, so these slides are going to go online uh, as soon as possible. I mean, you're going to have all of this. Uh, writing down each step, you're just writing down like that, that x to the 21 is equal to x to the 7 times 3. Like, you don't need to write that down. You just need to understand what I'm doing here. Philip, you have a question? So here you used the corollary to the FLT. Um, I will, I will hold that question until I, I hear from the instructors what they want, okay? Because in the course notes you saw, they did three to the 40, what day of the week will it be three to the 47 days from now? And they didn't put something next to each line. They could have put the CAM, congruence add and multiply, and CD, congruence divis dividing and all that. But they didn't do that in the course notes. They just said at the top, they're like, by these three theorems, we're going to do all this. Grayson? Uh, in the course notes, they call it corollary 15 all the time. Corollary 15, okay. Yeah, Versano? We just say C15. I don't know. Uh, that's why I'm saying. I said I'm going to tell you. I'm going to try to answer that later because I, I'm going to talk to the instructors about this. Okay. Good questions. You want to. You want to not lose marks on the exam, but I don't know the answer yet. So uh, we have to decide what we're going to do. Okay. So does anyone have questions about how this happened? Anyone have any questions? Okay. So we have now the Chinese remainder theorem. Okay. Chinese remainder theorem. Okay. Dui bu qi wo de zhong wen bu hao. I'm just saying my Chinese isn't that good. Bu hao means not good. You all know ni hao. That's you good. You good? You good? Ni hao. And bu hao is not good. Here we have bu jia shou. This is not known number, unknown number. You probably learned this as wei jia shou. But this poem is from 1700 years ago, or, well, more than a thousand years ago. Okay, so it's Buja Show. And this is a poem, right? It's six characters, six characters, six characters, six characters. So there's an unknown number. 
When you divide it repeatedly by 3, you get 2. When you divide it repeatedly by 5, you get 3. When you divide it repeatedly by 7, you get 2. What's the number? Okay? When you see 3 lines, that's 3. When you see 2 lines, that's 2. 5, 5 lines. The upside down 7, that's 7. Okay? So, there's an unknown number x. When counted in threes, we, get, we have two left over. When counted in fives, we have three left over. When counted in sevens, we get two left over. What's the number? Okay, so this was problem 26 of volume 3 of the uh, mathematical manual by Sun Tzu, uh, Sun Tzu Suan Jing. Okay, the mathematical manual written by Sun Tzu. Okay, in China, it's called the Sun Tzu Theorem. Or sometimes they call it the Chinese Remainder Theorem. Okay, this first two characters, that's China. Center, country. If you're in China, then China is the, cent is the center, right? If you're in Canada, then Canada is the center. Everything else is far away from us, right? So center, country. That's the Chinese Remainder Theorem. Okay, how many people know this? The, uh, the Art of War, the book Art of War. Philip, you know it? I mean, I've heard of it. Yeah, okay, there's two non-Chinese people in the last class that knew it too. Uh, well, you've heard of it from the last class. So. No, I, I have the book. Oh, you have the book, okay. This is written by Sun Tzu. The mathematics manual is written by Sun Tzu. It's not the same person. They lived 765 years apart, approximately. Okay? It's a common misconception. A lot of people think that uh, this, this, these two books were written by the same person, but they're not. 765 years difference. Okay, so... Sun Tzu explained how to solve the problem. He noted that 70 is congruent to 1 mod 3 and 0 mod the other moduli. 21 is congruent to 1 mod 5 and 0 mod 3 and mod, 3, I mean mod 7. 15 is congruent to 1 mod 7 and 0 mod 3 and mod 3, uh, mod 3 and mod 5. So x equals a multiple of 70 plus a multiple of 21 plus a multiple of 15. In this case, we have 2, 3, and 2 as the multiples. We get 233. You plug 20, 233 into that problem and you get that it's, uh, it satisfies all the conditions. So any multiple of 105 is also divisible by 3, 5, and 7, right? If I take 3 times 7 times 5, the product is going to be divisible by 3, 5, and 7, right? And if I take 105, which is the product of 3 times 7 times 5, and I multiply it by an integer, whatever that number is, is going to be divisible by 3, 5, and 7, because it was created that way. So. 233 solves the problem, and then if I subtract a multiple of 105, I will get 23, which is the smallest positive answer to this problem. Okay, this might have been fast. This is the way it was written in the book. Well, okay, it's translated, but this is basically what Sun Tzu did uh, uh, in uh, t between 200 and 400 AD, so 1,700 years ago, right? 1,700 years ago, approximately. Okay, so this is the Chinese remainder theorem written in the course notes. If n is congruent to a1 mod m1 and n is, con n is congruent to a2 mod, two, uh, mod m2, then if we find one solution to this system of congruence relations, we can find the general solution. Uh, we can find that the general solution is congruent to that particular solution mod the product of the moduli. Okay, now everyone remembers this. We did this not too long ago, right? This is from a previous final exam. We have x is congruent to a1 mod m1, x is congruent to a2 mod m2, x is congruent to a1 mod m1, x is congruent to uh, a2 mod m2. W you remember how to solve this? How do we solve this? Grayson. Basically turn one of the equations into a gigantic equation and then set it congruent to a lambda mod the other one. Okay, so we have 20, 20 n plus 12 is equal to x. x equals 20 n plus 12 will always satisfy this first condition. So x equals 20 n plus 12 satisfies that. We plug that into the second one. We have 20 n plus 12 is congruent to 11 mod 39. Then we do the same thing again. 39 y plus 11 equals 20 n plus 12. And then you can subtract out the 12 and 11, you get minus 1, and then you have a Diophantine equation. 1 equals 39y minus 20n, and you solve that Diophantine equation. That's still how you do it. Okay, Chinese remainder theorem doesn't help with finding the particular solution. It's just that once you find that particular solution, you can express the general solution as whatever that particular solution is. So you found one, if you found one solution to this system, 
then all of the solutions will be congruent to that particular solution modulo the product of the moduli. Okay, so you're still doing this. You're not using Chinese remainder theorem. You're just using that. And here's a generalization of the Chinese remainder theorem. Here you have k moduli instead of just two. And the general solution is the particular solution to the system of congruence relations modulo the product of all the moduli. And of course, in Sun Tzu's original problem, there is three moduli. Okay, so that was what we call the generalized Chinese remainder theorem. Okay, so here's an exercise from the book. Solve the problem posed by Sun Tzu that was discussed at the beginning of this section. Solve these simultaneous congruencies. The number, when you uh, repeatedly divide by three, you get a two. When you repeatedly divide by a five, you get a remainder of three. When you repeatedly divide by seven, you get a remainder of five. You can try this. There's still about 10 minutes left in the class, so let's try maybe five minutes. We, we don't need five minutes. Three, four minutes. Let's set it to four minutes. You can try this. It's very good practice to be able to do this. Uh, you don't need to use the Chinese remainder theorem to, to find the particular solution. Just to express the general solution, you're going to be using Chinese remainder theorem. But um, to find the particular solution, you use the same technique that we just used to solve the system of two congruences involving x. So I'll give four minutes or three minutes? What do you want? How many people want three? How many people want four? Okay, I'll give four. Does anyone not know what they're doing? They need some hints? Does anyone need a hint because they, they're stuck? They don't even know how to start? You don't even know how to start? What have you done so far? Zero mod the others. Oh, that's, so you're trying to solve it like Sun Tzu explained. Well, why don't you solve it? So instead of, so, okay, this is a good hint. Versano started doing it the way Sun Tzu did this. Well, I, I wrote out this um, 70 is congruent to 1 mod 3 and 0 mod the others. That is just for fun. That's the way Sun Tzu explained it in his book. However, we had a technique for solving systems of uh, linear congruencies. Let's use that technique because it's systematic. How else would you find the 70 and the 21 and the 15? You have to find them somehow. So let's just use the same, the same technique we used for this. So if you're using it, if you're trying to do what Sun Tzu wrote in that book, then um, I'm just advising you to try to use this technique instead of that. Okay, I see some people writing frantically and others not writing at all. Johan, you okay? You making some progress with this? Okay. Are you stuck? Okay, where are you stuck? Yeah, 3x plus 2 equals n, that's very good. Yeah, 3x plus 2, that's very good. 
So you have n, n equals 3x plus 2. That's very good. Okay, Nola? <coughs> okay, so how many people have reduced the first two congruence relations into one congruence relation? Okay, so you solve the first two congruence relations and then you get that n is congruent to something mod something else, right? Okay, good. Now, you have that uh, congruence relation and this third congruence relation. So now you have something exactly like this. You just have two congruence relations now. You have the one that you found by solving the first two, and then you have the third one. So you do the same thing again. So that's four minutes. Okay, now um, we could... I've given you time to think about this. You don't have to be able to do this in just four minutes the first time. So I just want to explain just so that everyone knows how to solve this. And uh, if you feel you want to, you can always go home and do this in more detail at home. Uh, but if I move on, then I'll at least be able to teach you some more stuff. So, we solve these first two the same way that we solved this system. We solve the first two congruence relations that same way. Now, you're going to get n is congruent to something mod something. You have a congruence relation. That's the, that's the general solution to the first two congruence relations. What did you get? Did you, what, what did you get for the answer to this, to, to this first two system of... Um, Rosano? 3x minus 5y is equal to 1. Okay, can you write that as a congruence? Oh, that's a Diophantine equation. Did you solve the Diophantine equation? No. Okay, did anyone solve the Diophantine equation? I think I got n is congruent with 8 mod 15. 8 mod 15, and how about Paige? What did you get? Um, for the solving the Diophantine equation, I got that x is 2 and y is 1. Okay. Yeah, and then can you put that into a congruence form, uh, like Eric did? I was honestly lost after that. Okay, Grayson? Eric's answer sounds right to me. Eric's answer sounds right to Grayson. Okay, so basically you solve the Diophantine equation, then you get something, you put it into congruence form. Okay, so all the solutions n are congruent to 8 mod 15 in the case of what Eric and Grayson got. So I won't just tell you the answer, but you'll be able to do this um, when you have more time available. So n is congruent to 8 mod 15 is what he got. And then we have n is congruent to 8 mod 15 and n is congruent to 5 mod 7. So we have two congruence relations and then we just do the same thing again, right? And so that is how we would get a particular solution to this system of three uh, congruencies. And then you can use the Chinese remainder theorem to represent the general solution um, in terms of the modulus 3 times 5 times 7. Okay? So that's how you would solve this. Splitting the modulus theorem very quickly. I have n is congruent to a mod m1, n is congruent to a mod m2, GCD of m1 and m2 is equal to 1. Then this system of uh, the system of congruencies has the exact same solution as this congruence. n is congruent to a mod m1, m2. Okay? Inverse Chinese remainder theorem. Don't call it that on the exam. Call it splitting modulus theorem. But basically, it looks very similar to the Chinese remainder theorem. We have GCD of m1 and m2 equals 1. Then we have n is congruent to a mod m1, n is congruent to a mod m2. If solving that is equivalent to solving this, okay? So, if we have this question, find all integers x such that x cubed plus x squared is congruent to 26 mod 35, how do you usually solve a nonlinear uh, Diophantine equation? Versano? Oh, Pardon me? Don't you solve it with, like, a table? You make a table for nonlinear uh, Diophantine equations, but your modulus is 35. Yeah. Do you know 35 squared? Do you know 35 to the uh, power 3? Do you know 35 cubed? So you have a big modulus. That's the problem now. So we're doing increasingly more difficult. Okay, at the first, at first you're like, how do I solve this linear congruence? Now you can do that. Then I give you nonlinear congruencies, but with a small modulus. Then I gave you a small modulus, but a huge exponent. Now I'm giving you a small exponent, but a big modulus. So now you can do everything. Versano? So, I mean, I know <coughs> Yeah. yeah, so we split the modulus. That's the exact. So solving this is the same as solving this system where we have uh, mod 5 and mod 7, because 5 times 7 is 35. So we have 
The same on the left is congruent to 26 mod 5 and 26 mod 7. 26 happens to be congruent to 1 mod 5. 26 happens to be congruent to 5 mod 7. So we do the tables because now these are small moduli. We've taken a big modulus, we've turned it into small moduli. You do the prime factorization for that. Now you have that uh, when x is congruent to 3 mod 5, then x cubed, uh, x cubed plus x squared is congruent to 1 mod 5. And that's what we wanted. And here, when x is congruent to 2 mod 5, then x cubed plus x squared is congruent to 5 mod 7, which is what we wanted. So we found our two solutions. We found a solution to this, and we found a solution to that. Now we have to put them together, right? We've found a solution to, to the first one, and we found a solution to the second. We have that x is congruent to 3 mod 5 is a solution to the first one. x is congruent to 2 mod 7 is a solution to the second congruence relation. So then how do we put them together? First, all general solutions will be congruent to any particular solution of the system, mod 35. Okay? So, how do we do this now? How do we put these two together? We have something is congruent to 3 mod 5 and something is congruent to 2 mod 7. Grayson? But Chinese remainder theorem doesn't give you the specific solution. Once you have a specific solution, it gives you the general solution. So that's a very important point I tried to emphasize in today's lecture. You have to find a specific solution. And how do we do that? We just do it by brute force, okay? There's no special way here. In, in the course notes, any number uh, mod 35, we're only dealing with numbers between 0 and 34, because 36 is the same as 1, uh, is, is congruent to 1 mod 35. 37 is congruent to 2 mod 35. So we're only dealing between 0 and 34. And the numbers 2, 9, 16, 23, and 30 are the only integers between 0 and 34 that are congruent to 2 mod 7. We could have done the same thing with mod 5, but there would just probably be more numbers. If we want to reduce this list of, of candidates, 0 to 34, we want to reduce that. Um, we might as well do it uh, via the larger modulus, because you'll be able to reduce more things that way. So these, these five numbers are the only ones that are uh, congruent to 2 mod 7. Now observe, out of those five numbers, 2 happens to be congruent to 2 mod 5. 9 is congruent to 4 mod 5. 16 is congruent to 1 mod 5. 23 is congruent to 3 mod 5. 30 is congruent to 0 mod 5. So we wanted something that was congruent to 2 mod 7 and congruent to 3 mod 5. These were the numbers congruent to 2 mod 7. And then one of them happens to also be congruent to 3 mod 5. So n0 equals 23. 23 is congruent to 2 mod 7 and 3 mod 5. We found it, okay? Brute force, but we got there. We got our particular solution to this system of equations. That system of equations is equivalent to solving this system of equations, which is equivalent to solving this. So we got a particular solution, n0 equals 23. So as long as x is congruent to 23 mod 35, then we have that uh, x cubed plus x squared is congruent to 26 mod 35. Okay? Does that make sense? Make sense to everyone? Is anyone lost? Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. So we've done splitting the modulus, we've done Chinese remainder theorem, we've done Fermat's little theorem. I would suggest over the weekend to try to catch up on the course notes, chapter 8. Um, if it's too much, just at least glance through it. Fill in the gaps that I didn't already, I already did a bunch of exercises, right? So just fill in, fill in those gaps. And then, starting Monday, we're going to do some applications from final exams where it involves Chinese remainder theorem, splitting the modulus, Fermat's little theorem, congruence relations, everything. There's just going to be some questioning. You don't know whether you use Fermat's little theorem or the corollary or Chinese remainder theorem. You don't know what to do. We're just going to give, uh, give you some practice for that. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention, and I'll see you on Monday. Have a fantastic weekend.